Okay, on the last time we finished up our hybridization and molecular orbital theory, and now we can move on to finish the rest of chapter two, which is not as quite a heavy material as that that we just covered. In fact, most of this you will have seen from general chemistry uh, with some extras along the way. So the next thing we want to uh, look at here are dipole moments once again. And the particular thing we're going to look at are what are called molecular dipole moments. Remember back in chapter one we saw how a bond could be polar, that is it had a dipole moment. For example, a carbon and fluorine. Remember that fluorine was more electronegative than carbon, so it had a dipole moment, a bond dipole moment in that direction. And so we had partial negative and partial positive charges on those atoms like that. Well, when we get to molecular dipole moments, all we're going to simply do is look at the full molecule. For example, let's look at this molecule. Okay, where I'm going to draw the three-dimensional structure and we have two chlorines and two hydrogens here. And here we can draw our dipole moments toward the chlorine there and toward the chlorine there. Remember that there is no dipole moment between carbon and hydrogen as their electronegativities were about the same. Okay. Okay, so those two bonds were nonpolar bonds. So the only polar bonds are here and here. What we do when we have a molecule is we see if they add together, and they do add together. They're pointing in the same direction. So here we get a net dipole moment, and if the molecule has a net dipole moment, that means that the molecule is polar. Okay? So that's what we do when we look at molecular dipole moments. If we changed up that molecule a little bit, and let's suppose we put chlorines on those bonds, then what would happen? Well, that means that these two bonds are polar, and so these two bonds give a net dipole in that direction. So you have a net here and a net here, so the overall net is what? They cancel, okay? And so, Overall, there's no net dipole, and so the molecule ends up being nonpolar. Okay? So if everything cancels out, then the molecule is nonpolar. But here we learn a very interesting principle that you want to make sure that you write down. That even though a molecule has polar bonds, that does not mean that the molecule is polar, does it? We just saw a case here. If a molecule doesn't have any polar bonds, then it will always be nonpolar. But just because it has polar bonds doesn't mean that the molecule itself will be polar because they can cancel. Okay, 
So I'll let you read the rest of this stuff in your book as they look at some other molecules with uh, dipole moments that cancel. Okay, so you can read this on page 64, okay, and page 65. Okay, so make sure you read pages 64 and 65. Okay, one thing that is worth noting here, just to do a quick other example, is uh, suppose we had this molecule. Okay, so here we have a carbon double bonded to oxygen and note the lone pairs on the oxygen. Okay, so it doesn't matter whether it's a single, double, or triple bond, if one of the atoms is more polar, then we have a dipole moment in that direction. But here, the extra thing I want to show you is when you have lone pair electrons. Those act as uh, electronegative entities. And so there will be a dipole moment toward the lone pair there, and a dipole moment toward the lone pair there. So these add up with this one to give us an overall strong net dipole in that direction. So all these three add up together. So this molecule would be a polar molecule, okay? So let's go on then and uh, look at one other thing here that's related. This is the topic of intermolecular forces. Intermolecular forces which sometimes call IMFs for short. Okay? Intermolecular forces, what are they? Write it down. These are the forces that hold molecules together. These are the forces that hold molecules together. So if my hands were two molecules, it would be the attraction, the attractive forces that would hold my two hands together. Another way to put it the intermolecular forces represent the stickiness between molecules, or the glue. Is there any glue or any stickiness between molecules that they would want to be attracted to each other? Okay? And it turns out to be different kinds of intermolecular forces. three that we'll focus in on are dipole-dipole, hydrogen bonding, and London dispersion forces. Okay? So let's take a look at these. Dipole-dipole are intermolecular forces between polar molecules. Okay? So if you have two molecules that are polar, they will be attracted to each other by that polar attraction that they each have, okay? So any two molecules that are polar will have dipole-dipole attractions. What about hydrogen bonding, okay? Write it down, hydrogen bonding is a type of dipole-dipole, okay? It's a subset of a dipole-dipole. And it has this set up here where we have where we 
we have a hydrogen bonded to oxygen or nitrogen. Okay. We'll take a look at that in a second. The last kind are the London dispersion. Okay. And this is basically the attraction between nonpolar molecules. Okay. So you would predict this kind of attraction to be what? Very strong? No, very weak. Okay. And so in fact, we can uh, rate the strengths of these intermolecular forces, okay? The highest strength here is hydrogen bonding, then dipole-dipole, and then London dispersion, okay? So again, London dispersion or forces between nonpolar molecules is always very weak. Okay, so let's take a look at some examples of these. And see what's going on. Let's suppose we had uh, this molecule here. one chlorine on the carbon atom, okay? And if you look, there's one dipole here, and so we have a delta minus here and a delta plus here. Let's bring another one in like this. We'll turn it upside down. see why we're turning it upside down in a second, okay? But here you see the delta plus and delta minus on that one. So the attraction will be between the minuses and the pluses. So we can draw the attraction by a, a dotted line, okay? And so here we have dipole, dipole, intermolecular force, okay? So that's the stickiness between those two molecules, okay? Let's look at an example of hydrogen bonding. Okay, let's erase this here. Okay, note here I got hydrogen on oxygen, okay, and let's draw another molecule down below. Like this here, okay. Remember in nature whenever you find a molecule, you never really find it by itself. There's always a bunch of them together. But here, we have dipole moments between the oxygen and hydrogen that we want to focus on. So you have one there, and you have one here, okay? So here we got some polar bonds, okay? Yeah, you also have a polar bond here, but let's just hold off, okay? It's not necessary to look at that one. So what do we have? We have a delta minus here on oxygen and on that oxygen, okay? Now here, what you want to focus on is this bond between oxygen and hydrogen. Hydrogen is giving its only electron it has in the bond. Remember, hydrogen is 1s1. So this one electron is being pulled toward the oxygen 
And so there's no more electrons with the hydrogen. So what will the delta plus be like on the hydrogen? The delta plus will be gigantic because there's no electrons left with hydrogen. Okay? So we got these big delta pluses, and that's what renders this hydrogen bonding. Okay? So that's why hydrogen bonding is stronger than regular dipole-dipole because that hydrogen gives a huge delta plus, which makes it extra attractive to the delta minus on the other molecule. Okay? So that's hydrogen bonding. Let's look at one more here. Let's look at two of these molecules. Okay. These molecules are called propane, which we'll learn very shortly in chapter three. But if you look on both of these molecules, there are no polar bonds, are there? We can't draw any dipoles. So the only attraction is a very weak attraction between the inner core electrons in carbon and the proton in the nucleus in carbon. Okay? That's a very, very weak attraction. Okay? So you do have very weak London dispersion that are holding them. Okay? And so that's how we designate those. Okay, well, the, the reason that we uh, look at these intermolecular forces between molecules is because we want to look at special properties of them. that we want to look at are the boiling point and the solubility. Okay? So let's look at the boiling point first. With the boiling point, you can write it down that the higher the degree of the intermolecular forces are, the higher the boiling point will be. Okay? So the stronger the intermolecular forces, the higher the boiling point will be. Okay? So for example, if we wanted to compare the boiling point of this molecule versus this molecule, okay, what's going on? Again, when we write one molecule, this can be seen as representing jillions of the same kind, okay? So when I say the boiling point of this, I'm saying that this is representing many in say a glass beaker, okay? The same thing if I wrote this, that this is representing jillions of those. So if I do that, what I do is I focus in on the molecule, and I see that this one here has the ability to hydrogen bond, and this one here only has what? These weak London dispersion forces. So which one do you think will have the higher boiling point? Yes, this one by a mile, okay? In fact, this one has a boiling point 
of 78. This one here is below room temperature. It's a gas at room temperature, so uh, a very low boiling point. Okay. Remember what goes on in boiling? Okay. If I had two molecules like this, okay, represented by lines, and I use these dotted lines to show the intermolecular forces. What happens when I boil? Okay. When I boil, I end up separating these two molecules. In other words, I do what? I end up breaking the intermolecular forces. Okay? So you can see that the stronger these intermolecular forces are, then I'm going to have to use what? A higher temperature to boil in order to separate them. Okay? So that's the theory behind the boiling point. Okay? Let's look at one other. property, and that property was the solubility, okay? So what does it mean if two things are soluble with one another? They what? Mix so they form only one phase, okay? You could dissolve salt in water. What happens? You no longer see the salt. It has dissolved or dispersed within the water, okay? And remember the general rule in solubility okay, that you learned in general chemistry is that like likes like. Okay? Or you could put it another way, that like dissolves like. Okay? So in other words, molecules that are similar to one another tend to dissolve in one another, okay? Let's take a look at some examples of this. Okay, let's suppose we had water and sodium chloride, table salt, okay? We already know that Salt dissolves in water, okay, so this is going to form a homogeneous mixture, a solution. But why is that? Okay? Well, water is polar. Where we have these delta pluses and a delta minus in the middle, okay? So water is a very strong polar molecule. What about sodium chloride? Well, sodium chloride is polar, okay? The sodium is all the way to the left on the periodic table, chlorine very close to fluorine. So this would be a very strong dipole. It's so strong that they want to separate into full positive and negative charges. Okay? So the delta minus from the oxygen will attract the sodium, and the delta plus from the hydrogen will attract the chlorine. So you got like mixing with like. Okay? So things that are polar tend to mix with other things that are polar, okay? But what would happen if we tried to mix sodium chloride with something like this? Would the sodium chloride dissolve in that, okay? In fact, it doesn't, okay? Because this is 
very polar, and this is what? Very nonpolar, okay? So they don't end up mixing. Okay, so if you did try to do that, the sodium chloride would just settle at the bottom of the glass. It wouldn't dissolve at all, okay? And this is kind of the setup for oil. Oil has a similar structure. You know that oil and water don't mix because the oil is nonpolar and the water is strongly polar, so they fight against one another. So the same thing if you took a jar of oil and threw in sodium chloride, you would see that they simply have no affinity toward each other at all. Okay, so that's the polarity effect of solubility that we want to keep in mind. Okay? So that takes us in this chapter through page uh, 71. Okay, so you want to be reading pages 70 and 71. And that takes us to the last part of this chapter. which really is a easy part. Okay. This deals with the functional groups in a molecule. Functional groups. What's the definition of a functional group? A functional group gives the identity of the molecule. Okay? So what do you mean by that? Gives the identity in terms of the identity in terms of the name and also in terms of the properties.
that's kind of related to the alcohol. Note, I have an oxygen, and that oxygen, write it down, is connected to one, two carbons. Okay? See how it differs from the alcohol? Alcohol has one carbon and a hydrogen on the oxygen. Here I got two carbons. When I have that, this is what's called an ether. An ether. Let's look at another one. This one here is where I have a C double bond O. Okay? If I look on both sides of that carbon, I have two other carbons. Okay? This is what's called a ketone. Because a ketone differs from this okay. <clears throat> See why this next one is not a ketone? Because I traded this carbon, the CH3, for a hydrogen. So this carbonyl has one hydrogen and a carbon. Okay. This is what's called an aldehyde. Okay. So write it down. An aldehyde has at least one hydrogen on this carbon with the double bond O. Okay. We'll look at some more examples in a little bit. Let's continue with these. The next one is this one here, or note I have a C double bond O again, but this time carbon and an OH on one side. When I have an OH there, this is what's called A carboxylic acid. Okay? A carboxylic acid. Let's look at another one. See how this functional group is closely related to the carboxylic acid, except instead of an OH, I have, write it down, a carbon attached here. And this sets up what's called an ester. Okay? So make sure you're making these little notes that I'm telling you that I'm not writing on the board. Okay? So this carbonyl has an oxygen, and that oxygen has a carbon on it. Okay? For the ester. Let's look at a couple more. Okay, here I have a nitrogen connected to a carbon. Okay, I got some hydrogens on there. This is what's called. an amine, an amine, because if you look at this next one, see how the amine is similar here, you got the NH2, but this is now connected to the C double bond O, and this is what's called the amide, the amide, okay? 
So a mean and a mids differentiated by this C double bond O that we'll learn later on is called a carbonyl. Last one here is where we have a C triple bond N in the molecule. Okay, this is what's called a nitrile. A nitrile. Okay. So these are the initial functional groups that you want to get down. Okay. There are a lot more functional groups that we'll cover as we go through 241 and 242. But these are the initial ones you want to get down. Okay, let's look at some examples, okay? And in the chapter, page 77, problem 2-20, you want to make sure you can tackle that one, as well as on page 79, number 21, and on page 80, 22. These are good problems that have different functional groups. So let's go over an example or two. So this is taken from number 22 in the problem. And what they want you to do is to identify the different functional groups in the molecule. Okay? So sometimes a molecule can have more than one functional group. Okay? I just drew them initially to get you started so that you see what they look like if you just have one functional group. But now, can we see what we have here? Well, I got a carbon with an OH. So we got a alcohol in there. We got C double bond C's, three of them. So we got some three alkene functional groups. Then you got another one here, oxygen between two carbons. Remember that is called the ether. Okay? So here we have three different functional groups in this molecule. Okay? Let's try another one. Here, what kind of functional groups are in this one? Well, here we have an NH2 on a carbon. Okay, so that was the amine. And then what other functional group do we have? C double bond O next to oxygen, and that has a carbon on it. So that would be what? The ester. The ester. Okay, a little tricky there. Okay. So make sure you can do these problems starting on page 79 in your book. 
so you can identify these functional groups because this is what you'll do on the exam. I'll give you different molecules or whatnot and you'll have to spot the particular functional groups. Okay. So this here ends chapter two. Okay. And next lecture will start in chapter three.